by the pricking of my thumbs, something wicked this way comes. Hello, and welcome to Rogue Reviews, episode 13. And tonight, we venture into the betrayal at House on the Hill. Finally, we get to do a proper spooky game, and this is an absolute treasure. This is a game that I've seen, I watched episodes of, and then I wanted to buy, and I arranged it, and we bought it, and it was great. This is a kind of unique game, really, in the fact that it combines both competitive and collaborative elements within the same game, and produces something that is an absolute riot of fun. The idea is that you have been summoned mysteriously to a house on the hill. You don't quite know why, and that will be revealed during the course of the game. Because guess what? One of you is a traitor, who has summoned the rest of the people there in order to do something despicably wicked with them. Maybe it's against their own will, maybe they're possessed, maybe they're the servant of some greater unknown being. That will be decided as the game progresses. And this is one of the most special parts of this game. This game has not one, but 50 alternative endings. Now, just imagine how often you play the games that you love. Now, you more or less know the way they're going to go, but the second half of this game can be completely different each time that you play it. And that is an absolute wonder to behold. The game plays up to six players, and it plays very, very well with a larger number of players. Um, the question is, do you stand more or less of a chance of winning? Mm, it can be a bit of either, really. Um, we love to play this with at least four or five people, if possible, though it does play very, very well with three, um, but better with more. Now, the other good point about this game is that you are building the game as you are going along. You have a certain amount of territory tiles, and this is a kind of modular board that you are collecting items. You're making your characters more powerful or more dangerous or more deadly, because guess what? One of you is going to end up being the bad guy. And that has a nice treat, really. So you're not quite sure whether basically by collecting extra items, building up your own powers and becoming greater and more powerful, you are in fact making it much harder for the other players to defeat you when you inevitably turn on them. But that's half the joy of the game. So. In a kind of delightful take on player versus player, let's get ready to explore the betrayal at House on the Hill. So, let's take a close look at betrayal at House on the Hill and a table view. This game is gorgeous to look at. The components are really good quality, made of very nice material, and there is lots of them to have a good look at. So to go into a bit more detail, you start off at the front door of the house in the entrance hall. You're given three fixed pieces that you always have in play. You have this tile, which is basically comprising of the entrance hall, the foyer and the grand staircase. You have the upper landing and you also have the basement landing. Now, as you can see, there are these little doors off there because this is how you basically build the board. There are a deck of room tiles that you can basically take. And depending upon where you're actually exploring, you put them into play at the given places. Now, let's start with the characters, shall we? There are six characters. Oh, no, wait, there are 12 because each of these is created double-sided, which gives you even more options for replayability. So say, for example, you could choose to become the gorgeous Professor Longfellow, who comes with a lovely painted miniature in the box, which is quite a nice treat. But if you didn't want to be the professor, you could also change and become Father Reinhardt, the rather devout priest. In a similar way, you could be Missy de Bourne, or you could be Zoe Ingstrom. You could be Brandon Jaspers, or you could be Peter Akimoto. You could be Madame Zostra, or you could be Vivian Lopez. You could be Ox Bellows, or you could be Darren Flash Williams. Finally, you could be Heather Granville, or 
Jenny Leclerc. So this gives you a nice choice. And the main distinguishing features between these, apart from the colors and the different bloody pictures, is these four stats. Now you have speed, might, sanity, and knowledge. Now these two are basically classed as your physical stats, speed and might. Speed is basically how quickly you can explore the house. Might is basically how strong you are in fights. Fairly obviously there. Sanity, mm, let me see if I have to explain that one for you. It's basically mental fortitude against the horrors that might overcome you in the house. Knowledge is basically a similar mental trait, but one that might be able to give you a little bit of advantage in terms of finding extra clues, that kind of things. So, as you can see, all the characters have a starting value which is marked in green. Now, other than the, basically the, the factors there, you can have a different expansion rate. So, for example, this person may start at four, but then they basically go up from four up to eight as a maximum. They go down to as far as three, and then you have a skull symbol. Guess what happens if you go down to your skull symbol? Yes, that's right, you die, but not yet. So depending upon the track, most people's maximum is a score of eight. However, the minimum may be lower or higher. For example, the sanity here starts at one and then goes up as high as six with a one, one, two, four, 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 four. However, the might starts at a three. If, however, you go to Professor Longheart, his knowledge starts as a five, but can only go as high as an eight. His sanity is reasonably low. However, if you look at Father Reinhardt, his knowledge is low and his sanity is high. I'm fairly sure you can work this out, that this basically gives you an idea of certain extreme characteristics. For example, high sanity, high knowledge, high speed, high might. And the other three, so the other four, are basically different values of middling characters, some more so than others. These are the more balanced ones, those are more the extreme. Obviously, if you're putting together a party, you can afford to have different ends of the spectrum there. So, where do we go from here? Let's look at the house itself. As I said, you're taking a set of rooms. So what kind of rooms would you find in a haunted house? Well, you could have things like the library. You could basically have the graveyard. You could have the organ room, the cave, the game room. Always a nice touch. Um, and those are the things that you'll encounter quite similar to various different horror tropes, as you might ex expect. Now, if you enter one of these rooms, you see this symbol here? This means that you draw an event. An event are basically your typical haunted horror things that may happen. It could be good. It could be bad. You have an event deck of cards. So you draw the top card and resolve it. For example, you might see an image in the mirror. You might hear a shrieking wind, or you might feel that it is meant to be, and you resolve the effects. Usually this is in terms of with rolling dice, or gaining or losing item cards, or gaining or losing effects, or doing things like that. So, a nice variety. There are a small amount of rooms in the house that will let you draw item cards. That's this kind of skull symbol, the sort of steer symbol with horns. So, for example, the larder, the vault, which is brilliant. You've, got, you've, you've kind of got a pass knowledge roll here to gain two items, very, very rare. Uh, the bloody room, uh, the wine cellar, you get the idea. Now, items are always good. They will always help you. For example, the bell, okay? The bell, gain one sanity now. However, of course, you lose the bell, lose one sanity. The armor, fantastic. Take one less point of damage. An angel feather, basically kind of lets you roll a one time uh, value of 0 to 8. But there's all sort of interesting weird thematically appropriate cards here. So you could have ceremonial robes, a medical kit, a lucky stone, pickpockets gloves, a music box, an axe, a bottle, dynamite. You get the idea. Okay. So there's a rather large amount of rooms, however, that you're quite trepidatious in going into because these are omen rooms. Little raven symbol here. So you could have the chard room, the master bedroom, the gymnasium, the kitchen, the dungeon, the pentagram chamber, the balcony, the catacombs. And these are the really, really powerful rooms in the game. If you basically hit one of these rooms, you draw an omen card. Now, in the same way that items are always good, events can be good or bad, well, omen cards are usually very, very powerful things that are usually more damaging for you 
than positive. However, they can be very powerful. For example, you might meet a madman and gain him as a companion. Gain two might and lose one sanity now. You might find a spear. You gain two additional dice. Uh, you might find a skull. Okay, so what happens when you find one of these items? Well, you make a haunt roll. Depending upon the number of omens in play, that's the number of dice that you roll. Now, these are basically D3. So you have a choice of zero, one, or two that you could roll. So you roll the number of, of haunt rolls there and you must roll equal to or higher the number of haunt rolls in play. For example, if there are three, three, three um, omens in play, you roll three dice and you must roll at least three. Oh, that's three, that's not too bad. Um, if at any time you roll under the number of um, omens, then the haunt happens. And that's the second phase of the game. Usually when we've played it, we manage to get to about four or five or six omens um, before things sort of go completely to pot. Um, however, it is entirely possible in the first few cards of the game to launch the omen, well, to launch the haunt, pre haunt prematurely, shall we say, which can cause rather drastic events because it usually means that the heroes, such as you could call them, haven't quite built up the abilities and strength to be able to deal with it yet. Because depending upon some of the rooms that you go to, you can gain events, so you can gain items, you can actually improve your stats. So certain, room, certain rooms, for example, um, the library, once per game, if you end your turn here, you can gain one knowledge. Now that's a permanent boost to your stats, but of course all these stats can go up and down. Um, and the game actually provides you with some little slotting on things to track the scores as you're going along. Now, the way you basically build the board is that on your turn, you may move up to your speed. So let's say, for example, you are Oxbellers and you are starting here. Your speed is four, so you could go one, two, at which point you basically draw a tile from the random ones scattered in. There are also some tiles which basically have no particular symbol. They're generally just relocation things. For example, the coal chute, the creaky hallway, the mystic elevator, which actually moves around the house, which is incredibly useful or incredibly annoying. So, for example, these will be shuffled up. And let's take one, for example. Ox is on the ground floor. So we basically draw a tile. It's the basement. So we're going to play that one. The next little tile is the ground floor. Let's see what it is. It's the kitchen. So, as you can see here, there are two door symbols which you can basically choose to place wherever you want. So, for example, if I wanted to pop box here and go this way, I could do, or I could turn it around so we go back this way. Let's leave it at that for the moment. Now, because he's basically in room where he draws a own um, card, we have to stop his turn there. And he's got a book, a library, sorry, a diary or lab notes, ancient script or modern ravings, gain to knowledge now. Okay, so that's not quite good for him, but of course, of course, cause doomed effect. His turn ends there. However, on a future turn, let's say, for example, the professor can basically move his orchids, for example, three, um, three, could start here and go one, and then move on, because this room's already been opened the first time. He'd then draw another room, upper basement, no, upper, no, upper ground, and it's the charred room. Lucky him, he's found another omen. Now, if possible, you should try to basically match up the doors as much as possible. If you can't basically end up block one, it's just kind of dead doors, you can't go through it, it's absolutely fine. But as you're going along, you're building up the rooms. You could choose to go up the grand staircase and you'll end up on the upper landing, in which case you can build a separate floor here and find some upper floor rooms. Um, if unfortunately you find the coal chute, which I think we found a few minutes ago, you plummet down into the basement. Now, on the ground floor, you are more likely to find events in the rooms, statistically speaking. The rooms on the upper floor present you with a bigger chance of getting items. The rooms on the, uh, the basement level have much more omens proportionally, so you don't want to get stuck in there. The only way out of there is to find the basement stairs, which are basically a car that is very, very hard to find. So it can be a case of once you're there, you're stuck there. This is bad. Now, let's see what happens if and when the haunt actually happens. Depending upon who, sorry, depending upon which omen was chosen, and which room it was found in, you basically have a completely different effect as part of the book. For example, let's imagine that our poor professor, where's he gone? Where's the professor gone? 
was in the child room and he found let's find an interesting one let's have that Ooh, let's go that one a spirit board so we have the combination of the spirit board and the child room let's imagine we're now on five omens we're rolling five dice and let's imagine some of those come up blank so oh dear we've rolled less than five the haunt happens now we have the professor or whichever player's profane the professor the spirit board and the child room so we consult the three books that provided we have the rule book the secrets of survival and the traitor's tome so for example we have the spirit board and the child room so the spirit board here in the child room we turn to haunt number eight now the person who is the traitor in Haunt 8 is the Haunt Revealer, which basically means that whoever is playing the Professor is the traitor who summoned everyone here to try and murder, deathify them, presumably, or some other nefarious plot. They then take this book and they leave the room, leaving all the other players behind with this. And this presents two halves of a story. Now, Haunt number 8 is the Whale of the Banshee. Okay. First, you hear a faint sound from outside the room as if someone was scrambling up the walls and scraping long talons across them. A few seconds later, you catch a glimpse of tattered silver robes swirling across the edge of your vision. You turn to run across the doors. You hear something enter the room behind you. The creature sighs. The sound creeps across the room and you feel a terrible chill boring into your heart. Death is nigh. Now, this tells you, the rest of the players, what you have to do to win the game. In other words, you have to defeat the creature or escape the house somehow. So, for example... It tells you what you do and the immediate effects you put into play, what you know about the bad guys, what's going on, how you're going to win, how to do it. Any particularly special rules, a little passage to read if you win. That's what you know, which isn't the full story. Meanwhile, the traitor, whoever they are, also has the Whale of the Banshee. But, but they're told from the perspective of basically someone who's deliberately brought the other players there because they're in cahoots with the Banshee, for example. Things you have to do right now, what you know about the heroes, you win if, for example, oh dear, you win if all the heroes are dead. Fantastic. And you're basically helping to play as the Banshee. Now, all these things are basically characters. You win if. Now, then the game ends the second phase, where the heroes have certain victory conditions that they're trying to fill. And the traitor, who may be playing as the actual Banshee themselves, or may be playing as their character, and the Banshee, for example, depending on whichever whichever haunt you're playing, uh, depending whichever creature or magical power is involved. Sometimes you have the actual character itself is either locked out of play or destroyed, and therefore you're just playing as the evil entity. Whichever way it works, it's kind of a game of secrets from that point on. The traitor may basically see that, for some reason, the heroes keep hanging around the basement quite a lot. They keep going out of that room, the Pentagon chamber. but they don't know why. They keep making certain rolls. Meanwhile, for example, the heroes might know that they have to, for example, pass three knowledge rolls in the Pentagon chamber to find a secret out by the Banshee, and then they've got to go and locate, for example, the organ room to do something else. You get the idea. They're given certain objectives they have to fulfil, which usually means they're basically crisscrossing back and forth across the um, house. They may be fighting battles and rolling mic dice and basically taking damage. Um, they're basically maybe being shocked or horrified. Generally, before the haunt happens, your stats don't change that much. If you're lucky enough to find one of the boost rooms, that's fantastic. Go there as much as possible, try and get all the party there uh, and improve their stats. If your scores basically decrease for whatever reason, maybe something bad happens with an event or whatever else, they can't go lower than the bottom value. You can't hit the skull before the haunt. Once the haunt happens, you can. If your stats go down to the skull, you're dead, you're out of the game. So, for example, in the traitor's term, um, they want basically all the other players to die. Huzzah. Now, what basically happens is if you're caught in a battle, normally a physical battle, like, for example, you're attacking by uh, a werewolf, for example, you might roll a certain amount of dice. For example, you're rolling three dice if your might is three. Oh, dear, you did really, really badly. Let's imagine that the werewolf's might is four. It rolls the dice. Okay, it did rather well. Now, the difference in those two roles is the damage that one party does to the other. If, for example, it's physical damage, then um, either the enemy basically takes enough damage to basically destroy it or weaken it. But if you take damage, 
you must decrease your stats by the appropriate amount. So in the example that we saw there, if you took four points of physical damage, you would have to lose four points between, between might and speed. You could split this up, for example, losing two points from might, two points from speed, or three of one, or one of the other, or four on the zero. The main thing is you do not want to get down to zero, otherwise you are a goner. Um, obviously, if you're fighting certain other creatures or if you're in other circumstances, you might take mental damage, in which case the reverse is true. You have to reduce it from sanity and knowledge. And again, try not to hit zero. So, as the game goes on, basically, you are building up a wild and wonderful um, house full of amazing details. Um, there are some really amazing, brilliant rooms to find. Um, and these will sort of continue to spread out as the game goes on and you can end up with an absolutely huge mixture of different places some of them far harder to escape than others as you can imagine so it becomes kind of amazing of itself the plays can get quite spread out or they can get bunched together it's depending on how sort of pally pally and how sort of cooperative you want to be early on in the game because it's difficult to know that one of you is going to, going to turn traitor um somewhere along the lines of the game. And that's why it might turn off certain players who might want to be in this game, maybe, maybe not. Um, I know that my son and I really, really love this game, whereas my daughter and my wife, less keen because of this whole twisting element of it. My wife loves competitive games. She doesn't always love collaborative games. So this kind of got right on that edge for her as well. Um, it really depends how much enjoyment you have of the theme, because so much of this game is the theme. So, it is a it's an absolutely really wild ride. We've only played about sort of about a fifth of all the scenarios in the base game. But of course it doesn't end there, because after a long period of time, the designer was finally persuaded to release an expansion pack for the game, which is The Widow's Walk. Now, it's quite obvious which way they decided to go with this, because the house is clearly filled out in different directions. They've already built down, there's only one way to build. Up. So they've basically decided to flesh out the roof at the top. So there's basically new rooms, um, new different haunts, new cards, new buildings, places. So for example, you can now access the roof in your cards. So you might basically find the solarium with a very strange um, item there. You might find the nursery full of creepy dolls, no doubt. You might find the sewing room. Ah, important. There's also dumb waiters which let you travel between floors more agilely than using the stairs. These are all course built around the roof landing. As well as that, it did actually add rooms to other areas in the game. So there were extra cards, for example, around the basement, but they can have the arsenal to be found, or the storm cellar, or the laundry, or the tree house. Ah. There's a nice variety of extra items. Um G. I wonder where I might have seen these two before. Hint, hint. Um, there is clearly an ode to classic horror fantasy, well, horror fiction films um, in here. The Evil Dead, under no surprise for most people here. Um, there's brand new Traitor's Tome with brand new haunts in. And of course, the Survivor's Tome as well with how to defeat them. This more or less doubled the lifespan of the game in terms of the breadth and depth and options and replayability, it just added more. It didn't sort of like transcend the game in itself. It just added more of the good stuff that people really loved about it. We've seen that really successfully with things like Kingsburg, um, where it basically built on the existing game without destroying the game. Things like Seven Wonders as well. The expansion pack to Seven Wonders, when they do well, they just kind of add more options. They don't basically change what you already love about it. So it is a fantastic game. Why might you like this? Why might you not like this? How do you to play? We can discuss all of that in the final thoughts. Is this a game I see before me? Its box outstretched towards my hand. Come, let me play thee. So, I think it's no surprise to say that I really, really love this game. Um, it has wonderful theme. Um, it has such commitment in terms of developing the actual world that it sits in, in terms of the events, in terms of the items, in terms of the omens. It does what it sets out to do really, really well. It creates this really tense atmosphere. As the game progresses, it kind of um, intensifies in terms of the tension where every single haunt roll might flip events. 
Um, and if they do, you, again, you have no idea what's going to happen. In terms of the person who is basically making the role, odds are it's going to be them, but it could be the role to the, it could be the person to the role that's left or the person to the role that's right. It could be the person who's got the highest uh, knowledge or highest sanity at that point of the game. You really don't know who is going to be the traitor. And therefore, you don't know whether you're putting yourself in a good position or a bad position, um, finding different events, finding different items and building characters up. So it is a delightfully tense and um, not too macabre. I mean, yes, it is a horror theme, but it's not like overtly gory. Um, and it's not to an extent where reasonably old children couldn't enjoy it. I wouldn't basically play around this with a bunch of three or four year olds, obviously. Um, but children who have a little slightly um, taste for macabre, shall we say, will thrive on this game. It's no surprise that my son loves it as well, because he's the whole idea of basically like the spooky haunting element with rushing on magical items. He loves that. Um, so this is a tremendous play. Um, offers something a bit unique in terms of the collaborative and competitive elements. Um, the theme is, of course, fantastic. The expansion adds welcome legs to the game um, without changing it utterly. And you will come back again to this with different players in different situations, different environments. This would be a wonderful themed game for a particularly spooky night, Halloween treat, for example. Um, but it offers so much as a game that other games just sort of don't come near to in terms of the options or the theme or the take on it. Or the, how can you not love a game with 50 different possible endings? Um, so House on Haunted Hill, so Betray the House on the Hill. It is a star of a game and you would be very, very happy to play this, I hope. Um, certainly if you know anyone who has to play it, get them to run it for you, um, probably more than once, and see how the different haunts compare and see how the experience compares. It's definitely a tense game, it's definitely an excitement game, suspense, a little bit of horror, a little bit of thrills. Um, it is going to be a really, really fun evening for you. Um, in terms of length, it is going to be a deep, well, unless the haunt happens in the first few ro rolls, it's going to be a decent length of time this game. It will probably be the major focus of your evening. So if you're going to play it, maybe warm up with a couple of lighter games first, um, then edge into this one. Um, what this game will look like if you walk past the table, it will be wild and full of excitement. People will be kind of like tense. You'll, you'll probably be able to listen to the actual tension in the air as you walk by. They'll either be wildly excited or kind of like holding back in fear or nerves, um, but it is definitely a high excitement kind of game. <sighs> Lovely. So, if you'd like to contact us, as ever, you can find us at rogueartistcreations.com. On Facebook, we are Rogue Artist Creations. Our Twitter handle is at Rogue A Creations. You can reach me, Andrew Prouse, at gmfirst at rogueartistcreations.com. Please share, please follow us, please like this video, um, please become a subscriber to us, everything you can do um, to really just help us get the word out there and help us make more fantastic reviews. We know we're just beginning, we know we're quite young at this game. However, these are things that we love and we love talking about it, love sharing the hobby, hopefully attracting more people into the games. And hopefully just giving in some wonderful times with friends and family and all the rest of it. All right, thank you very, very much for a spooky, spectacular episode and we will see you again next time.